it was about an hour before dinner time, and I went and checked on the status of the meat we'd pulled out of the freezer, and it was still frozen. And that was my fault, because I forgot to pull it out when I was supposed to pull it out. And so it wasn't fully thawed. And I hate cooking, grilling steak that is partially frozen and partially fresh. It's just a, I'm not a good enough cook. And so I decided, let's do something else. And so I ran to the store, and I got some of those prepackaged, already made wings. And I'm like, I can throw those in the air fryer. I won't mess that up. And uh, so that's, that's what we did. And we threw those in the air fryer, and, and everybody was, was eating, and everybody was fine. And, and as, as dinner progressed, one of my sons had one chicken wing left on his plate and he, he looked at it, and he said, this, one, uh, this one's too crunchy. And I said, all right. He said, I'm still hungry. And I said, okay. Eat the wing. He goes, it's, it's too crunchy. I said, okay, there's more wings over there. He goes, okay. I said, are you still hungry? I said, yeah. I said, I'm not your mom. So... <laughs> And I know, I know what he's going through in his mind, because that's the difference between the love of a father and the love of at least his mother. Because if this situation would have happened with my wife, she would have gotten up and, and she would have gotten the wings, brought them right over to him and catered to his every little desire. And I love him equally. I just choose to parent in a different way. And I want to teach him self-dependency. And you can accomplish things yourself. And so I pointed out to him where they were and let him know he was welcome to take his plate over there and get as many as his little heart desired. Sometimes in life, that's how we are. Sometimes in our relationship with God, that's the way we present ourselves. Sometimes we wait for a miracle. Sometimes we wait for a supernatural act of God, and the entire time God has given us the capacity and the ability to do it ourselves. We're going to look at that dynamic today. If you have your phones or your tablets, I'd invite you to follow along with us this morning in the Bible app. It's a free resource that you can find in whatever app store you utilize on your device. And once you have the Bible app installed on your device, there are a number of great features. The feature we use together each week is called the events feature. Either enable your locations or search up Lakeside Algoma will pop up. You can follow along with us that way. If you have a traditional Bible with you this morning, we are in Genesis, the very first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter 42. If you're joining us via the stream this morning, thanks so much for joining us. My name is Brian. I'm part of the team here at Lakeside. The verses will be available for you on the screen below. We've been walking through a look at the life of a man named Joseph, and we've seen God do some extraordinary things through his life and in his circumstances and situation. Last week, where we left off our look at the life of Joseph, he has now interpreted dreams for Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, and he told him, there's going to be a great period of prosperity in this land, and then that period of prosperity is going to be followed by a famine so severe it is like one that has never been seen before. And, he and Pharaoh put him in power, made him the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. And he gave him great responsibility, and he, he, told, he told Joseph to implement the plan that God had helped him come up with. And that plan was to tax people and then to take that take that reserve and hold on to it for people. And then when people needed food, they would come buy back the food that, that they had. That's where Genesis 41 leaves off. And we pick up in Genesis 42, beginning in verse 1 and 2, we read these words. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die. So we switch gears again, just as we saw happened in Genesis chapter 38. We switch gears again. Again, this is parallelism. And the spotlight is taken off of Joseph for, for a little bit. 
And this time, the spotlight is placed upon Jacob and his family dynamic. We reconnect now with Joseph's family. We haven't connected with Joseph's family since Genesis chapter 38, where we saw Judah and the disastrous relationship that he had with his daughter-in-law, the death of his sons, the birth of twins. After Genesis 38, the spotlight was brought back onto Joseph. Here, the spotlight is taken off of Joseph and placed once again on his family, this time on his father Jacob and his relationship with his children. And Jacob says to his sons, hey, be proactive. We're starving. Go fix it. Gives me a little hope for my children that these guys, way older than my kids, are doing the same very thing my kids are doing at the dinner table. They're hungry. Their father knows where food is, and they're doing nothing about it. And the father looks at his kids. It's like, hey, fellas, or idiots, based on what generation he came from, we don't know, all right? Whether he did the whole gentle parenting or was a little bit more direct, but he's letting them know, we're starving and there is food available. Go get the food. That's the conversation that's going on here between Jacob and his sons. Now, the reality is, from our perspective, this is obvious. We can zoom out. We have all the information available to us. When you live in the immediacy, when you live in the climate, things can sometimes get a little more complicated. When it's your circumstance and it's your situation, things for some reason get much cloudier. It's why in life sometimes you can look across the street or you can look across the cubicle, you can see your neighbor's circumstances, you can see your coworker's situation, and you know exactly what they should do. And by the way, you're not wrong. It's clear. It's obvious. But sometimes when we find ourselves in a situation just like that, whether it's analysis, paralysis, whether it's because there's grief involved, whether it's just the stress of having to face the situation ourselves, we sometimes lose that clarity. And sometimes in certain situations and in certain circumstances, we stay stuck. And sometimes we wait on God to do the supernatural, and we wait on God to do the miraculous. And make no mistake, God can do the supernatural, and God can do the miraculous. But sometimes God just wants us to move. He's given us the faculties. He's given us the minds. He's given us the abilities to just handle things. Not every circumstance and not every situation we find ourselves in do we need to wait on a miracle or wait on the supernatural. And Jacob tells his sons, go get the food. Now, could God supernaturally provide food for them? Absolutely he could. But that's not how God chooses to work most of the time. And here, Jacob tells his kids, go get food. This doesn't, by the way, diminish the role of God in our lives. As though we act upon things ourselves that we're not being full of faith. No. God has given us faculties. He's given us abilities to move and to act. So ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brothers, for he feared that harm might happen to him. Notice what's going on here. The pain of losing Joseph has marked Jacob. It has changed him. The pain of losing Joseph. Remember, at this time, Jacob believes Joseph is dead. That's the story that his sons have told him. After they sold him into slavery, they took the robe, they slaughtered an animal, they 
they messed up the robe. They brought the robe back, said that they found it, said a, a wild beast must have torn his body to shreds because, believe it or not, when you go home and tell your dad, hey, your favorite child who we didn't like, we were going to kill, but then we decided let's leave him alive. So we just roughed him up a little bit and then sold him into slavery. That messaging isn't going to go over well. And so Jacob believes that Joseph is dead to this time. And by the way, that's one of those that there is no amount of time that passes that you're like, all right, is this one safe to tell mom and dad now? You know, you, you sneak out when you're, when you're growing up. Generally a good, okay, never a good idea to sneak out. If you're going to, which you should not, you're going to want to wait more than a couple days or a couple weeks to break that to your parents. Just trust me, okay? I'm, you should not do it. Don't do it. But if you do, wait like at least a year. Then it becomes a little, little funnier. You know, you wait five years, you're golden. You're golden. You wait five days, you're grounded. That's the difference. That's the difference. But if you, if you take your brother and sell him into slavery, that's one you carry to the grave. There is never an acceptable time that that's going to be like, oh, yeah, remember that time where we uh, took your favorite son and we got rid of him? That's not going to go over well ever. And so Jacob is under the belief to this day that his son is dead, and it has marked him, and it has changed him. And some of you have experienced something in life that has marked you to your core. And it's changed you. And you don't look at things the same way. By the way, this doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. Sometimes there is loss that will forever change us. Now, sometimes that can be accompanied with depression. And if you're wondering what is the difference between a, a grief that lasts and, and depression or something that you can't overcome, and if you, you feel like you're, you're maybe stuck in a scenario or a situation, I would encourage you to talk to somebody, talk to a great Christian counselor, talk to, talk to me, talk to somebody on the team here, somebody that can walk through and lovingly help you identify. But if you've ever had to bury a child, if you've ever lost somebody that is near and dear to you, that's going to change you. That's going to shape you forever, and it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you and your ability to cope. Jacob is like, I'm not sending Benjamin. I've already lost one. Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now here's what's fascinating, as we saw Last week, when we saw that Joseph was 17, when he, we were first introduced to him in Genesis 37, he was 30 when he was put into a place of authority with Pharaoh. And then there were going to be seven good years, followed by seven lean years. So he is at least at this point, Joseph, at least 37. which means God has been orchestrating these events for this family for two decades. And they have no idea. 20 years of trials, 20 years of turmoil, 20 years of hardship, 20 years of grieving as though you've lost a child who's still alive, 20 years. This family has endured all of these things. And God has a plan and God has a purpose. 
which is a reminder to all of us. We never fully know everything that God is orchestrating. And so when times are hard, and they don't let up, and the days turn to months, turn to years, turn to decades, it's not without precedent. We see it here, that God is working for decades, and He's about to pull something off that is beautiful and wonderful and redemptive and and full of restoration. But 20 years of trials and turmoil and hardship, all part of his plan. Now, Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. But he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from, he said. They said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Again, it's been 20 years. 20 years of time has passed. Appearance has certainly changed. They think he's dead. They think he's gone. They think there's there's nothing we're going to have to worry about there. Joseph sees them, and he recognizes them immediately. When you are the victim, you carry hurt. When you are the victim, you you carry things that the offender has long forgotten. This, by the way, is why forgiveness is so vitally important. Because as the person who's been offended, as the person who's been hurt, you carry a weight that many times, I would say in most circumstances, the person who offended you, the person who wronged you, they have long forgotten. And if there is a lack of forgiveness, you alone carry a weight that only weighs you down. Joseph has an encounter with his brothers, and he immediately knows it's his brothers. His brothers see Joseph, and they have no idea. Joseph doesn't even register in their minds at this point. And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had dreamed of them. And he said to them, you are spies, you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man, we are honest men, your servants have never been spies. He said to them, no, it is the nakedness of the land you have come to see. And they said, we, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is no more." Now, Joseph vividly remembers what he had dreamed at least 20 years before. He remembers what he had vividly dreamed about his brothers bowing down to him. And then Joseph, he's got to think on his, he's got to think. He's got to put a plan into action rather quickly. And so he begins to accuse them of things. He begins to say, you're here as spies. You're trying to overthrow You're trying to overthrow the government. You're trying to take over. You want to survey everything, go back and wage war against us. When things are prosperous, it's a lot harder to arrange those things. In times of of hardship, it's much easier. And so Joseph uses that ploy and he says to his brothers, you are here to spy out the land so that you can come conquer our country. I said, we've never been spies. But Joseph said to them, 
It is as I said to you, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of you and let him bring your brother while you remain confined that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. And so Joseph accuses them of being spies, knowing full well that they're not spies, but this is a plan that buys him time. And now the brothers are placed under arrest, they're being held, and they're held for three days. Joseph devises a plan, and now the roles are suddenly reversed. And on the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this, and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us, and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. Now there's a test. Joseph gives them a test. And the reason that he gives them a test is in their last interaction, they were a little less than trustworthy. And by a little less than trustworthy, I mean bound him against his will, sold him into slavery. When you've been hurt, you do not have an option of whether or not to forgive. That is required. But forgiveness and reconciliation are different things. And certainly as people that love and follow Jesus and God who redeems all things, we should always strive to have things reconciled. But there are faults and there are failures that will sometimes forever shape a relationship. Be quick to forgive. That is mandated. But it is okay to be slow to trust. It is okay to have, to have a reconciliation roadmap and a plan for restoration. Those things do not have to be immediate. And Joseph wants proof. Now the brothers remember their actions. And they feel like they're victims of karma right now. They flash back and they feel like, well, it's because we did this to Joseph. That is why we are in this situation and we're in this circumstance. And Reuben, like any good annoyed mother, is like, told you so. Told you we shouldn't have done it. Told you guys we should have been much nicer to Joseph. Told you we shouldn't have sold him. Not always the most helpful messaging while you're sitting in prison trying to figure out a plan, but there he is. The choices we make have consequences. Now, the message of the cross and the message of grace is that God has forgiven us all of our failures and all of our mistakes. And we rejoice in that fact. And we praise God for his forgiveness. We praise God for grace. We praise God for mercy. But make no mistake about it. There are still consequences for our choices. (laughs) 
Sin still messes things up every single time. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. And he returned to them and spoke to them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack, and to give them provisions for the journey. This was done for them. Then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed, and as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack, and he said to his brothers, My money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this their hearts failed them. And they turned trembling to one another, saying, What is this that God has done to us? Now, the brothers don't know that Joseph knows Hebrew. They have no idea that he can understand everything they're saying all along. And Joseph sees based on their conversation, that they've changed. That they are no longer the same people they once were. And isn't that the hope for all of us? That we are not the same today as we were a year ago? or five years ago, or ten years ago, or twenty years ago. And again, in our cancel culture, people love to go back. If you have an X account, put it on private. How many times have we seen a new athlete Or somebody who strikes fame. And all of a sudden, a journalist with an article and a need to get exposure goes back into a Twitter account to find a joke that's reprehensible. But how many of us are guilty of making a joke at 14 that we wouldn't make at 40? In a culture that has just discovered that the internet lives forever, how many lives and how many people are going to be destroyed in the pursuit of profit? Never put anything out there that you wouldn't want your worst enemy to see. But as people that love and follow Jesus, that have been recipients of forgiveness and recipients of grace and recipients of mercy, we all the more need to be people who are quick to forgive. That doesn't mean we excuse that which is inexcusable. But as people who've been recipients of grace, let's extend grace to others. Let's give them room to grow. Let's give them room to change. And let's realize as people mature and hopefully as, as they meet Jesus or as, as they go through a process, they're not the same. Because if Joseph operated here as our culture does today, it'd be canceling. Remember what they did to you. Destroy their lives.
And by the way, for what it's worth, we have to extend that same courtesy as people that love and follow Jesus to people that disagree with us. He sees they've changed, and he provides for them. He returns their money in the process. But the brothers don't know who Joseph is. They don't know what Joseph's up to. And now they think Simeon is a dead man. When they came to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, We are honest men. We have never been spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. But the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me. Then I shall know that you are not spies but honest men and I will deliver your brother to you and you shall trade in the land. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their fathers saw their bundles of money, they were afraid. And now fear sets in. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. And Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin? All this has come against me. And Reuben said to his father, Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him in my hands, and I will bring him back to you. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is the only one left. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you are to make, you would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to Sheol. The pain of losing Joseph has stuck with Jacob, and now he's flashing back to the grief of 20 years before. The loss, the heartache. And now there's the idea in his head that he's got to go through all this again with Simeon. And he says, no. And Reuben says, I promise you on the life of my kids, I will protect Benjamin and this will work. But Jacob remembers his grief. And he says, no. I don't know what you're experiencing. I don't know the trials. I don't know the turmoil. I don't know the hurt, and I don't know the loss. But I know that God had a plan here. And I know that God has a plan for you. And I know this doesn't make it feel any better in the moment. But 20 years, two decades, God is at work in this family's dynamic and they have no clue what he's up to. And so when you find yourself facing that trial, when you find yourself in the midst of that turmoil, when you find yourself dealing with pain that is so great, it feels like it's going to break you and it's going to destroy you. The hope I can promise you is this. That God still has a plan and he still has a purpose in your life. And even in the midst of our pain, he still works. God, I pray for the hurting. I pray for the suffering. 
pray for those who are trapped with turmoil all around. God, I pray in the midst of their heartache and in the midst of their hurt. The fact that you are good and you have a plan would scream louder than anything else. That uncertainty would not get the final word. Got to pray for those who've been wronged. And who know they need to forgive, but just carry the weight of what happened to them. And the person who wronged them, they don't carry that weight any longer. I pray that you'd help them forgive. I pray that they'd be wise, God. the process of reconciliation. God, thanks for having a plan for us. And at times it's hard to see. Even in certain circumstances, sometimes, God, it's hard to believe. I pray you'd be honored and glorified in the way we live our lives. Jesus, for your glory, Jesus, we pray.